Unit 10, Chemical Bonding, Lecture 2. Formal charges. Now, formal charge is, well, it's one way to determine which structures are reasonable, and it's also a way to determine which structures may contribute more or less to the hybrid offspring structure. Here's how you go about finding it. First, you determine the number of valence electrons for an atom. Then you determine the number of electrons that that particular atom is responsible for. Well, what do I mean by electrons that an atom is responsible for? They're these. It's responsible for its own lone pair electrons, plus it's responsible for one electron from each one of its bonds. So an atom is responsible for its own lone pair electrons and one electron from each of its bonds. So you have to be able to know the valence electrons for the atom, how many of those are electron pair electrons, and which ones are bonded. And you do that by finding the Lewis structure. To calculate the formal charge, you take the valence electrons and subtract from it the responsible electrons, the electrons for which it's responsible, and the result is the formal charge. You may want to pause this and jot all this down and then start it back up again. A good example of this is nitric acid, or HNO3, but I want you to write it like this. The reason I want you to write it like this is that when you have these oxy acids, like nitric, sulfuric, phosphoric, etc., you're going to find the hydrogen is bonded to the oxygen. So write it like this. Now, here's one possible structure that you might have, right here. Nitrogen is your central, you've got the oxygens around it, you've got the hydrogen here that bonded to one of the oxygens, and the electrons are distributed. So, what do we have? Well, Let's start with this oxygen right here and see if we can find the formal charge. Now look at its electrons. What does it have? It has six valence electrons. Let's count them. There's a pair there that's a lone pair. And there's another lone pair. That's four of them. It has one electron from this bond and one electron from this bond. This is the way we count them. So we are talking about two, four, five, six. It has six electrons for which it is responsible, giving it a formal charge of zero. Got it? So the formal charge on that oxygen is zero. Now let's look at nitrogen right here. Stop for a minute and try to figure out the formal charge of this. You may stop the video if you want to. Then come back and I'll show you what I got. Did you get a positive one? Did you determine that nitrogen, which has five valence electrons, is only responsible for four here, one from each of the four bonds, therefore having a positive one? Now, what's the formal charge on this oxygen right here? You need to pause this for a moment so you can figure it do so. Meanwhile, I find the formal charge to be zero because nitrogen has two pairs of unshared electrons and picks up responsibility for two electrons, one from each of the bonds, giving it a total of six. That is why it has a formal charge of zero. What is the formal charge of this oxygen right here? Stop and figure it out. Do you agree with me? I think it's negative one because it's responsible for six electrons from the three lone pairs and one of the, the, that pair of electrons that's shared with nitrogen, giving it seven electrons for which it is responsible and only six valence electrons. All right. This structure is a good parent. It's a good parent because the positive charge and the negative charge are adjacent and the others are, are zero charges. It could have been better 
had everything been zero, but I'm not sure there's a parent with that criteria. So let's look at another parent and see. Meanwhile, that's a good one. Look at this now. Consider first of all, what is the formal charge of each one of these? Go through and check. It's very much like the previous one, isn't it? I just put the double bond on a different oxygen. And if you will look at this carefully, you will see that it has the same spread of charges as the other, and it is also a good parent. So now we have two equally good parents. Let's look at this parent, or this prospective parent. What's the formal charge of this oxygen right here? Two, four, six, and one, seven. Yeah, from six, negative one. That's right. What about this nitrogen right here? What's its formal charge? Did you get plus one? Good. What is the formal charge of this oxygen right here? Did you find it also to be a plus one? And one more to look at. What is the formal charge of this oxygen right here? Stop for a moment, figure it up. I get that it is a charge of a negative one. Now, folks, this structure is not a good parent. But let's review why it isn't. This oxygen has a negative one formal charge, and so does this one. The nitrogen is a plus one. That's fine, because you have a plus one or plus charge between two negative charges. But look, this oxygen is also a plus one. So you have two plus ones together. That is not a good idea. Let's go through and look at what makes a good parent. What's the criteria for good parent structures? Well, zero charges, if at all possible. And we couldn't come up with a parent structure this time that had good zero charges. Alternate positive and negative charges. You don't ever want two positives together. You don't ever want two negatives together. And the sum of the formal charges must equal the charge if it happens to be a polyatomic ion. So what we're saying, in effect, is that this is a hybrid of three contributing parents. But the first two contribute by far the greater amount, by far the best amount, to the structure of the hybrid. In this problem, we're asked to give at least two parent structures for carbon dioxide, and we're told it's linear. We're also asked to determine the formal charge for each atom, and then we are asked to select the most stable parent, which happens to be the one, then, that's going to contribute the most to the hybrid offspring. All right, CO2. Well, let's see, we've got 4 here, plus 12 here, is a total of 16 electrons to distribute. All right, and it's linear, and carbon is the central, so we have oxygen to carbon to oxygen. Now we have 16 electrons to distribute. We have two for each of the bonds, so that's four. This is six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. Now, each oxygen has eight, but carbon only has four. So let's borrow some. Why don't we take this pair right here and move it here and make a double bond? And maybe do the same thing here. Take this pair here, move it over, and make that be a triple bond. Now look at this. When we look at this, the oxygen has access to eight. Two from each of the bonds in the triple bond, and two out here that are the lone pair. So let's do the formal charge. 
Well, let's see now. This oxygen has six, and it's responsible for two from the lone pair and one from each of the bonds, so that's five, and that gives it a plus one. Okay. Now the carbon has, is, has four valence electrons, and it's responsible for four, so that gives it no formal charge at all. And this oxygen over here, which has six valence electrons, and it's responsible for two from each of these lone pairs, that's six, and one from the bond, so that's seven, gives it a formal charge of negative one. Got the idea? All right, now let's take this. Oh, by the way, if it works that way, then it should also work this way. The oxygen could have triple bonded to the carbon here and single bonded to the oxygen there. And are these two the same? Is, are these the same? And the answer is, think about putting a heavy isotope on one of these oxygens. Make it a, a heavier isotope, and then you'll see that those two are not the same. All right, but hey, there's another parent structure that we need to look at, and that's this one. Let's go back to carbon and oxygen with placement of those electrons around the oxygen, just like we did before. My pen and I are not getting along well. Sometimes that happens. Now, let's move this pair of electrons here and make a double bond. Get rid of that. And let's move, say maybe move this pair here and make a double bond and get rid of that. Now look, let's see what we have here. The formal charge, well we have six valence electrons in oxygen. It has two, four, it has two from here, two from here, that makes four, and one from each of these bonds makes six, so it's six minus six is zero. Now, carbon? Carbon has four valence electrons. It's responsible for one from each of those four bonds. So that gives it a formal charge of zero also. And for this other oxygen, well, it's responsible for four from the lone pairs and one from each of those bonds. It has six valence electrons and it's responsible for six. So this gives it a formal charge of zero also. Sometimes I have more structures in my zero than I meant. All right, there we go. No formal charge here. We have a formal charge over here that is minus one and plus one. A formal charge here that's plus one and minus one. With the central part as being zero, this is all zero. This is the best structure right here. It is the one that is the most stable. It is the one that's going to contribute the most to the hybrid offspring. Got it? But you know, there's a question you need to ask. Is this molecule polar? Good question. At this point, my students usually had two questions that they were concerned about. One was, do I have to memorize exceptions? Here we are going to exceptions. Or is there a way to predict when octet exceptions are going to occur? And how do I know what shape molecules have? For example, how do I know that water is bent but CO2 is linear, other than the fact that every time you write it, you write water bent and CO2 linear? Well, the answer to both of these questions lies in a quick survey of valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, VSEPR theory. VSEPR theory, valence shell electron 
repair repulsion theory. To determine shape according to Vesper, we need to follow these rules. Rule number one, select the central atom. Well, that's easy. You know how to do that. It's the one you have the fewest number of. Rule number two, determine the number of electrons surrounding that central atom by counting the valence electrons of the central atom and adding to that one for each atom attached to the central atom, except for oxygen and sulfur. If oxygen or sulfur, either one, are attached to the central atom, you don't count anything for them. The only time you count electrons for oxygen or sulfur is when they happen to be the central atom. You add one for each negative charge, and you deduct one for each positive charge. Now, let's, let's pause for a minute and let you try these first two rules. Try NO3. Well, let's see. The central atom is nitrogen. You have five valence electrons for that. You don't count anything for oxygen because it's not the central atom. And you add one for the charge. So it's five plus zero plus one gives us six. Got it? Look at H2O. What's central? Central is oxygen. So you have six for the oxygen plus one for each one of the hydrogens, giving you a total of eight. Well, what about carbon dioxide? What do you think about that? What's central? Okay, how many do you add for oxygen? All right, so we have four plus zero is four. Let's look at PCL5. Central, that's right, phosphorus. How many valence electrons? Five, yes. And how many for the chlorines? One for each of those. So that gives us a total of 10 for PCL5. And I3 negative, what's central? That's right, iodine is central. And it has seven. And we pick up what? We pick up two from the other two iodines and one for the negative charge, giving us a total of 10. XeCl4, xenon tetrachloride. We pick up how many from xenon? Eight. And how many from the four chlorines? That's right. Eight plus four to get 12. Now that's the way you do the first two steps. Now let's go to step three. In step three, you divide the result of step two by two and select a geometry from the following table. Now when you divide the result of step two by two, if your answer is two to dividing by two, then your geometry is linear and the bond angles are 180 degrees. If when you divide by two, the answer is three, your electron density geometry is trigonal planar, and the bond angles are 120 degrees. If your answer is 4, the electron geometry is tetrahedral, and the bond angles are about 109.5. Now, it, to be more exact, it might be 109.46, but we'll live with 109.5 just fine. If you come up with five areas, your answer is five, then your geometry is going to be trigonal bipyramidal. You might need to learn to spell that. And your bond angles, some of them are 90 degrees, some are 120 degrees, and some are 180 degrees. And if your answer is six, your electron density geometry is octahedral, and your bond angles are either 90 degrees or 180 degrees. For our first example, let's use beryllium bromide. Now the central atom is beryllium with two, and we pick up two from bromine, giving us a total of four. We divide that by two, and that gives us two. And what does that tell us? That the geometry is linear. Therefore, the structure of this has beryllium as the central atom and bromine on either side. And the bond angles there, 
180 degrees. Get the idea? So that's how we know that's linear. Well, let's look at another example. How about boron tribromide? Well, let's see. We've got 3 plus 3 is 6. 3 from boron plus 1 from each of the three bromines, giving us a total of 6. Divided by 2 is 3. So the geometry, then, is going to be, according to the chart, trigonal planar. What does the structure look like? It looks like this, and it's as flat as a pancake. That's right, it's all in the plane. And all of the bond angles are 120 degrees. For our next example, let's use carbon tetrachloride. Carbon is 4, plus we pick up 4 from the 4 chlorines, giving us a total of 8. Divide that by 2 and get 4. And the table tells us that the geometry is tetrahedral. And what we have is a carbon in the center with four chlorines equidistant from each other, giving us bond angles of 109.5 degrees. The chlorines are located at the angles, the four angles on a tetrahedron. You may be able to see it better like this. It may give you more of a three-dimensional look. But the thing that you need to remember is these bond angles are 109.5 degrees if all four things attached are the same. Here is a little bit of a different structure I want you to do. This is the sulfite radical. It has a negative two charge. Sulfur is central with six. You pick up nothing from oxygen, and you pick up 2 from the negative 2, giving you a total of 8. Divide it by 2 and get 4. And according to the table, then, the geometry of this is tetrahedral. Now you're going to begin to understand why I talk about electronic geometry. The structure is like this. We have oxygen at three points on the tetrahedron, and the fourth point is occupied by a lone pair, a pair of unshared electrons. The bond angles are 109.5 degrees. Now I'm going to write this structure a little differently in the next screen, and it's like this. We don't, we're not going to show the line as if it were a bond. We're going to show the lone pair in that fourth position. So you see that actually this thing is a pyramid structure that has a triangular base, but the geometry is tetrahedral. The bond angles are actually a little less than 109.5 because those lone pair electrons on sulfur compress the electron bonds to the oxygen, pushing them down a little bit. Well, we're going to work a lot more with this, more with Vesper theory in the next unit. Now let's talk about three types of exceptions. The first type we want to talk about is the incomplete octet, and we're going to use boron trifluoride as the example. There are two possible Lewis diagrams for this. Here's one, and here's the other. Now let's go through and do our evaluation. What do you think we have here? Well, let's check the formal charge. All of these are zero. I'm going to stop for a minute, or you can pause the video and double check to be sure you understand why each of those has a formal charge of zero. Now let's look at the one on the right. This fluorine is zero, seven minus seven. The boron is negative one. Boron has three valence electrons, but it's responsible for four. That's how it gets the negative one. This fluorine is zero, seven minus seven. And this fluorine over here is positive one. Do you see how it is? It's seven minus six. This one is very poor. This one, however, is excellent. When I say the one on the, the right is very poor, 
it does have a positive next to a negative. It's not the worst possible case, I'm sure, but it does not compare to the one on the left. So the one on the left is going to be the predominant structure. This kind of situation is typical of small 2A and 3A central atoms like boron, in which you have boron with actually only six electrons about that central atom. Instead of the shape on the right, or instead of the Lewis diagram on the right showing us eight, which just does not happen very much. The second type of exception we want to mention is the expanded octet, and we're going to use chlorine tribromide as our example. Now here is its Lewis dot diagram. It does look a little strange, I recognize that because you're looking at 10 electrons around the chlorine. But folks, that's the only way to prevent undesirable formal charges. And we will talk about what the geometry is of this in the next unit. The third type is the one with odd number of electrons. Let's look at nitrogen dioxide. Now here are three possible Lewis dot diagrams for the structure. You can have this one. Notice everybody has an octet except, oh, the oxygen over on the right is shy an electron. And in this one, everybody has an octet except nitrogen, which is shy an electron. And here, everybody has an octet except the oxygen on the left, which is shy an electron. You have an unpaired, unshared electron in each of these three cases. And atoms are polyatomic ions with an unpaired electron are called free radicals. And these can be very, very reactive entities. Can you see why it would be inclined to double up and form N2O4? That's right. When you have an unpaired, unshared electron, you have a highly reactive potential. Free radicals are intensely reactive particles. They are atoms or molecules or ions that have an unpaired, unshared electron. And that unpaired, unshared electron in most any atom or molecule or ion except metals in certain conditions is going to produce a situation in which you have an extremely reactive entity that is looking to pair up the electron. They have created havoc for us. For example, the ozone layer. The ozone layer of the Earth is a very thin layer that protects, very thin meaning it's not very dense, I'm sorry, but it's a layer that protects the Earth from solar ultraviolet radiation. The solar ultraviolet radiation, if it were to strike the Earth extensively and hit living entities here, would generate all kinds of problems, producing, among other things, a bunch of free radicals. But anyway, chemists thought some years ago that they had a solution to another problem. That problem thing they could use as a propellant, something that they could use as a refrigerant, Something that they could use to clean these, these chips that go in computers. They found chlorofluorocarbons, wonderfully non-reactive compounds. They seemed to, be, seemed to be very, very safe to use. They were not flammable. Until as they used them, they began to discover that the ozone layer was being decimated. Why? Because these chlorofluorocarbons, such as Freon-12 or R-12, were breaking down in the upper levels of the atmosphere. And when they broke down, they would produce free radicals. And these free radicals would attack the ozone in the ozone layer, causing it to form oxygen, O2, and repeating the free radicals. Well, the thought might be, well, O2, okay, so what's the problem? The problem is that O2 doesn't protect us like O3 does. We've got to have the O3. And furthermore, 
when these free radicals are regenerated, they come back and attack more ozone molecules, converting that to oxygen, generating free radicals, and go around again. A chlorine-free radical, for example, can take out as many as 80,000 ozone molecules. So it's back to the drawing board. To try to find compounds that will do the jobs that we need done, such as act as refrigerants, or propellants, or things of this type. But compounds that will be safe, because we must protect our ozone layer. Now let's look at polar bonds. You've heard of polar bonds before. These are bonds formed by the unequal sharing of a pair according to the model that we're working with. The more electronegative atom will have a greater share of the electron pair. Do you remember what electronegativity is? We talked about it as the attraction of an atom for electrons and it's actually the attraction an atom has for its own outer shell electrons, but it is expanded to consider electrons in general. Let's note trends. Let's review our table of electronegativities and look at trends. Here's the table of electronegativities, and you will recall that electronegativity increases in these directions. Fluorine was the most electronegative element, Francium was theoretically the most electropositive. So electronegativity increases in this general direction. Characteristics of polar bonds. They're characterized by the presence of dipoles. Dipoles are equal and opposite charges separated in space. And when you have equal and opposite charges separated in space, you have something we call a dipole. Let me show you. Consider HCl, gas. This is a polar molecule. You have hydrogen bonded to chlorine. But the hydrogen is somewhat positive. That's a delta positive, meaning a change toward positive. And the chlorine is a change toward negative, or delta negative. Chlorine has the greater access to the electrons. It is more electronegative. It pulls on the pair of electrons harder. So the hydrogen is somewhat positive and the chlorine is somewhat negative. And we indicate this by drawing an arrow in the direction from positive to negative charge. And if we draw a, can draw a single arrow to reflect this, draw a single arrow with a bar from the center of the positive to the center of the negative, that shows what we call a net dipole moment. You will understand net dipole moment better if you've ever studied vectors and when you look at another example. Let's consider the water molecule. Here's the shape of it and you know that the hydrogens are less electronegative than the oxygen. So the hydrogens are somewhat positive and the oxygen is somewhat negative. Are there dipoles? And the answer is, oh yes. You can draw arrows showing the direction from positive toward the negative charge. There's a dipole there and there's a dipole here. Now the question you have to ask is, if you have two different dipoles, is there a net dipole moment? Can you draw a single arrow to show a general direction of the flow of charge? And the answer is yes. Well, where is it? In what direction is the net dipole moment? And it's right there. Going from the center of positive, which is between the two hydrogens, to the center of negative, which is toward the oxygen. Well, let's continue with this. Let's do a review of the bond types and talk about how to predict. There's a quick set of rules we can use. Remember what we said about ionic bonding, that if you have elements from the S and D blocks bonding with nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or negative polyatomic ions, those bonds are probably ionic, and others are some form of covalent. 
And if you think you're dealing with a covalent structure, you better check for a net dipole moment. If the covalent compound has a net dipole moment, the bonding is then polar covalent. If the covalent compound does not have a net dipole moment, bonding is nonpolar covalent. There's something you need to look at, though. Consider carbon dioxide. Carbon is 4, picks up none for oxygen, gives us the total of 4, divided by 2 is 2. That means the structure is linear. So we have carbon in the center and bonded to two oxygen. And I have distributed those four electrons so as to give the carbon uh, access to eight electrons. The structure has to be linear. And of course, if you went through and tracked the other electrons, you'd find them distributed about that if you did a Lewis structure. Now, let's look at the dipoles for a moment. The carbon is somewhat positive and the oxygens are somewhat negative. So which way are the dipoles? Well, they go from positive to negative. So there's one in this direction and there's one in this direction. Are we getting anywhere? Is there a single arrow that can be drawn? And the answer is no, there's no single arrow that can be drawn. The dipoles are exactly opposing each other. Hence, there is no net dipole moment. Therefore, the carbon dioxide molecule, for your purposes, is nonpolar, a nonpolar molecule. Try ammonia. Now, we went through the process. I went through the process, figured out the geometry, knew that it was tetrahedral. It has a lone pair. Is the sharing of the pairs equal? Hmm. Do you have dipole moments? Well, there's a dipole in that direction, dipole that direction, a dipole in that direction, because nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So can you draw a single resultant dipole? And the answer is, yeah, right up through here. Well, if you can, then what does that tell you about the bonding? What is the resultant bonding? And the resultant bonding is polar covalent. Polar covalent. Got the idea? What are these? Yeah, you know what they are. They are lone pair electrons. Well, we've covered ionic bonding. We talked about the cases in which ionic bonds formed. We talked about the lattice network, things of that type. Then we talked about covalent bonds and sharing. We talked about covalent bonds and sharing and, and the, the electron distributions. We talked about Lewis structures and how to, how to perform the operations that are needed to design Lewis structures. We talked about resonance hybrids, that interesting idea that you can have multiple parents with a hybrid offspring and that you can't describe the, the offspring very well with electron distribution, so you do it by describing the parents. And some parents contribute a lot to the hybrid offspring and some contribute very little. We talked about formal charges as a way of helping us clarify which structures were better. We talked about the octet exceptions and promised to, to do more work with this in the next unit. And we wrapped up on polar bonds. It has been an interesting unit. A better way to teach and learn chemistry.